Hey, thanks for tuning in. We are Living Fit, your trainer's trainer. We not only have education courses for trainers to upgrade their game, but we have full on follow along programs, workouts, exercise breakdowns, nutrition plans, and fitness equipment for you to reach your fitness goals. Now, enjoy the show. Oh, without further ado, Kenny Kane on the Living Fit Show with Aaron Guyette. Uh, Master Coach, Education Director with Living Fit, but man, I have the absolute pleasure. As soon as I saw Kenny Kane's name pop across my computer screen, I wet my pants. No, not really, but figuratively, it was a a little bit of an orgasm. Uh, Apologies to the audience there, but I was (laughs) super ecstatic to be able to spend some quality time talking with Kenny Kane. And then... He did me a little bit better. He said, oh, I'm going to talk about not needing social media. So I'm just going to stop there. We will get into that before we get into that. Kenny Kane, thank you so much for hopping on. Hey, first of all, it's a pleasure. And with that intro, we might want to, at least for this episode, rename the podcast to Tinkle Time with Aaron Guyette. And then, it's, and, then if you have a sound, and then if you have the sound effects guy, it'd be like, oh, <laughs> here I am, ladies and gentlemen. None of you know of me because I'm not on social media, but we will talk about that for sure. And dang it, it is good to see you, Aaron. Man. Doing good, brother. You're doing good. You're helping people. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Well, same, same for you. It's, dude, it's an absolute pleasure to see you. Again, I'm absolutely honored. And then, uh, by the this- way, but at some point, we need to, like halfway through the thing. <laughs> You need to like put a cashew on one side, and, like try to bounce. <laughs> I'll it just off. hang my coffee cup from it. Yeah, yeah, like on the hook of, of your mustache. <laughs> then you can lick it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh. Uh, well, so I, I got introduced to you. Um, it was the Barbell Shrug podcast you were co-hosting, and I mean, you were radical, ex- like exciting. You you made it hilarious. But then you would just like switch and be, and be like uber science, like, well, what about this? And what about that? And how about this? And I, I just freaking love it. Uh, what what got you into fitness? Obviously, you've done some incredible things, but what got you into fitness? Well, first of all, I was kind of, frankly, I was born into it. Like the, I was raised in a fitness club. Um, that was our family business, 16 acres of land in Northern California, uh, my mom was a world-class coach. My grandfather was the manager of the 68 Olympic team. So I, I grew up around Olympians, the, the highest the pedagogical sort of range of coaches. I just happened to be around because that's what my family, that, that you know, as an infant and a toddler, uh, you know, when I was in diapers, Mark Spitz was at our house for dinner all the time, you know, and th- that's just, I was raised in a house like that. And so part of it is just luck frankly. And, um, you know, I would say in particular, the the driving force has always been at like my, on the soul level, my mom. And my mom had the best kinesthetic eye that I've ever seen in sports. She coached sports that she never did as a female. Um, So she coached a bunch of male sports. Like I, I when I was in high school, she was coaching some of our soccer teams and she just nothing, um, made her back down. So she was a lioness that played with lions and mauled them. And so there's all kinds of stuff with that. I got a mom who will fight men, you know what I mean? (laughs) And win, you know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. In fact, when she was a youth, she used to set records shore to shore swimming in the Golden Gate. So before Alcatraz was closed, she used to swim out to it and they would tell legendary stories of the guards coming up with guns going, you got, first of all, they're like somebody's swimming to the island, which was at that time thought to be impossible. Yeah. Um, that's why they put it there so that nobody could escape Alcatraz yeah. alive. They would die in the shark infested Pacific of the Golden Gate. And she's just out there as a 18 year old swimming with no wetsuits because it was pre wetsuits. And what they did back Jeez. then to stay warm is you'd cover your body with Vaseline, um, some petroleum jelly, and you'd swim out through the sharks to Alcatraz and swim back. You know what? For shits and giggles. That's my mom as an 18 year old. So 
she went on to change the landscape of aquatic. She developed the modern skull in swimming. So that's how um, like synchronized swimmers and water polo athletes propel themselves out of the water. Mm -hmm. So she developed a technique that advanced, you know, people's propulsive ability. So it's like the, in track, you have the Fosbury flop for, you know, a hundred years, people jumped over the high jump belly first yeah. and then Fosbury went, nah, I'm going to kind of flip it around. And then suddenly the records went up. And so, that's my mom's sort of invention to aquatic sport. And so she was just an innovator the way that she thought. And so I got to tell you, Aaron, like, like if I have one fiftieth of what my mom did uh, as far as like a kinesthetic eye and creativity when it comes to movement, and then also the other part of it, which is equally important, is you have to have the scientific sort of brain, but you also have to have the the, the, the heart and, and understanding the, the, the dynamic of a human in sport in real time um, and, and in context, which is always dynamic with, with how people are moment to moment, day to day, month to month, year to year. And so um, because that's evergreen, you know, she, she had a, just an innate sense of how to push people at the right times, but also like the, the right thing to fix their stuff. You know, so some people are more technicians, some people are more cheerleaders, you know, she, she was able to kind of play it down the middle uh, and, and, and hit both. And that, that inspired me um, I, at, at the time as a teenager, I was like, in, in growing up, I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, mom. And then her lessons keep dripping into me. And then on top of it, I was blessed with uh, amazing coaches in martial arts and soccer and track and in fitness, like uh, legends, it's sort of. Um, taught me. So I, I was, I was, I've been very lucky, uh, Aaron, frankly, to, to, to be in the position that I am and, and to have had the success. And, and, and a lot of it is exposure and doing something with that exposure. So it's not one or the other, it's kind of both. So I, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. I said a lot. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, well, I, I will say a little bit about uh, the Golden Gate and the Bay Area waters. So I didn't know this. I went to the Caribbean with my grandfather, my uncle, my cousin, my grandfather and uncle, which have now passed. So I'm absolutely grateful to have been there with him and my dad. And we sailed the Leeward Islands in the Caribbean. And they asked my grandfather, who was going to captain the ship, they're like, oh, well, do you have your credentials? Do you have a license? Do you have, you know, asking for all these things? And he goes, well, I sailed in the Bay Area and, and you know, the Gold, where the Golden Gate Bridge is or whatever. I'm not even kidding you. It was like a free pass. It was like, you know, yeah. it was like, oh, well, Water. if you can sail that, you can sail anything. So here's our boat. Some of the rough currents. In the and world. your mom is swimming in it. I just, that's my body. Like it's sailboats get smashed apart yeah. easily. <laughs> and your mom is in there swimming. And swimming to Alcatraz, no less. <laughs> when it's a prison. Wow. And and swimming shore to shore. And she would, she would compete in open races and beat all the men. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, she was just a beast. Love it. Just a, Love a it. beast of a human. Yeah, so how do you not, right, end up in fitness, I guess? Uh, but the, the thing is, like, I mean, I know that you spent some time doing stand-up comedy yeah. and all that. Years. that right? Uh, yeah. That was my way to reject my mom and what would wind up being my destiny. We all have a rebellion to play with our parents, and that was yeah. mine. Yeah. And I loved it. I love stand-up yeah. comedy. I got to see the whole world. And yeah. Just... It would, an amazing journey but that was yeah. like a part of me that just i needed to scratch that itch and 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 know that like okay i can write something down on a piece of paper and then turn that into art and then somebody's gonna hire me for that and do that for 15 years and wow yeah. i mean that's uh, that's so cool I'm very lucky to do yeah that. well and I, th I most people don't understand like the amount of work intentionality focus consistency right even just something like that takes which obviously plays perfectly into fitness it's like okay same same, same concepts thing. here it's the same thing like look yeah. show up do something consistently with effort with intent handle your failures because by the way sport is a great teacher for stand-up and stand-up is a great teacher for sport because guess what there's a lot of failure along yeah. all of it. and same with entrepreneurship and business and all of it there's just there's there's just yeah. some failure and so you know there's something very uh powerful in staring at a room of people who hate you and after your first five minutes going i'm scheduled to do an hour and i have 55 rough minutes to go 
<laughs> so where are you from, sir? <laughs> like, it, 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 it really is. And like getting through that just helps develop a, um, a toughness of, of skin and helps with that emotional fragility. I mean, because comedians need to be remarkably sensitive emotionally on one hand and on the other, if you're not durable and if you're not resilient, um, it, it'll crush you. I mean, you'll, you'll, yeah. you'll become like a pathological narcissist by mid to late end of your career, which happens very frequently. It's a brutal, it's a brutal lifestyle because you, um, if, if, you're, if you don't have emotional safeguards and tools to handle the dynamic nature of, of just how tough it is, it can be, it can be um, quite a difficult career choice. Um, yeah. I chose to get out because I, I you know, the, the, the window of time, I, it, I stopped being hungry for it. And that's the one yeah. thing I learned from sport. When you're, when, you're, when you're no longer hungry to do it like that, I got to do this kind of just sort of goes to sleep and it stays asleep for a while. That's your sign. It's like, yeah. Yeah, time to hang up the cleats or the shoes or the jersey or whatever. Yeah. And uh, to really try to listen to that. And that, that moment came for me. I was very successful in touring the world and making a living doing it. But it was when it was time to hang it up, I was like, time to hang it up. And my friends were like, what? You're, you're, at, you're auditioning for movies and TV shows. And you, you've had sitcoms that have almost gone to network and all this stuff. And it's just like, yeah, but like, that's not, that's not, and that's not why you do it. You do yeah. it because... It, it brings meaning and it stopped bringing meaning to me. So, yeah. I'm out, you know? Yeah. Which I mean, uh, that's what, when I, the last time I, I chatted with you, I was up in Santa Monica. I was up at Oak park and yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It was like bringing tears to my eyes, you know, you talking about, and, and then, I, and then listening to the continuation of that on the body of knowledge. Right. Yeah when you're on that and uh and are you still doing that by the way no we did the three seasons andy had his second kid I, I, we were saying it was just like we got to. all right you know what i mean yeah. and, then, and then the COVID hit and we're just like okay so we but i saw andy on monday night at week nice. people don't know who andy is but uh or maybe no they yeah they i've he, interviewed him on here so they, yeah they hopefully they're, they're watching all of the shows if you, yeah. if you haven't yeah. watched all of them you better go back start from no <laughs> yeah, yeah. no andy's amazing and he he gave a talk to my treehouse group which we can get into i run a men's yeah kind of an executive men's group and he gave a talk um for them the other night and uh just completely blew him out of the water it was amazing yeah i freaking love that guy yeah, um, sort of yeah. So, but yeah, talk a little bit about maybe the, the evolution, if you will, of, of, of Park, your, your space, your community. Um, and then I want to, I just want to steer that right into the, so what's social. this about social media and not, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we are one of the first CrossFit affiliates. We, we opened as a CrossFit gym in 2004 and here we are in 2020, it's almost 20 years now. So it's just mm -hmm. like for us, in the CrossFit world, that's like truly dinosaurs. <laughs> just for like, there's still a few alive. Like they didn't die and turn to oil. You know, it's, just like, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Like that we're, we're, and we are in the best position that we've ever been. Um, we have really figured out what our voice is and what our message is. And we, we, we've come to understand that CrossFit is such a helpful tool to help our base but it's not the it's not the thing that defines us which is a, a really critical distinction because we're living in a time with siloed methodologies being value systems and so meaning we this is the, this is the way that i train i do this or i, I do that or, and i i've just come to see over decades of like breath work and meditation and martial arts and crossfit and you know national class level sport like dude it's yin and yang these things go together you can't the hard and the soft like the the, the, the they're kind of inseparable yeah. and so we've yeah. really designed a program that in in a, in a very succinct way is about growing people sustainably and the way that we do that is through something that we call ghp general human preparation and if we're not mindfully saying to our population, hey, what you're doing physically is a conduit 
to you being a better person. Like that's our explicit conversation at Oak Park. That's all we're trying to do is just go, you get married to one thing or to another. We do the sun on the ice. We do the breath work or we do CrossFit or we do some kind of competition or we do a triathlon or whatever. All of it goes into this larger thing that's like, look, these will be seasons that you experience. But in the arc of it, is that training for that season helping you grow as a person? And that is, that's a very complex conversation to have with an athlete or, or a client because it requires A, reflection on your part as a coach and B, reflection on their part as an individual. And then finally, as a collective, as a community, that's very dynamic because you've got people coming and their context is different than somebody else's, yet we all kind of share this thing. So you always have to kind of shrink it down to the, what, what's the, what's the 30,000 foot perspective? You're trying to grow over time. If you only do one thing, you may just by definition limit your growth. But if you can expand your capacity as a human to take on a variety of things with intention, it is so likely that you are going to grow. And that is very explicitly what we try to commun communicate in our um, dialogue with our with our student population and and really develop and hone as a, a coaching team. So as a segue into social media, and I know that that's what you want to get to. I, I you know a few years ago I did some deep reflection and the reflection was it, it it started personally, but it was also segueing professional because people were always like you know in the early two teens and stuff. People are like Kenny, you got to get on socials, man. You you just you. you I mean, your energy, you got so much to say and this and that. And I'm just like, okay. And then I do it. And I, and I always kind of felt like my feeling was I felt hollowed out and I kind of felt shelled and I didn't know what it was, but that, that was my emotional experience. And I'm pretty tuned to that. I go, fuck, I don't, I don't really feel good doing this, but okay. Uh, and then, and then like, oh, are you, when are you going to post? I, 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 I got a good idea. For, I was like, uh, yeah. and, I, and then, <laughs> And then, and, and then it was just this like muddled emotional nonsense, right? Like I'm supposed to, or I should. And it always left me feeling bad, but I didn't know what the bad was about. Yeah. And then I, then I just took a sabbatical to understand social media. I took a sabbatical. I took time off. I took basically a half year off. And, and then three months, absolutely, I did not see anybody. And meaning my clients are... Uh, any of that. All I did was go to coaches meetings and, and, and work on development team and make sure the business was running in the right direction. The rest of the time I was just reading and understanding. Mm -hmm. And I boiled it down to this, is that in the way that I've come to understand it in, in a simple framework for your listenership and your viewership is this, like technology inherently isn't necessarily bad or good. However, there is a distinction between extractive technology and regenerative technology. Extractive technology, by definition, needs your human time, your attention, your impulsivity versus intentionality, and needs you, it needs to be valuable to the shareholders, negativity. And part of that is because, and we, if we can start in reverse order or from the top of the order, but let's just start at the top. So what are my four points? Time, attention, impulsivity, and negative emotions. Those are the four points, but time. The average person on the planet, if they have two social platforms, let's call it YouTube and Twitter or Snapchat and TikTok, whatever, just take two, is spending two hours a day minimally on those platforms. That's not to account for every time you go on or think of or twitch for one of these things, um, the amount of attention that it grabs from you and the amount of time that it takes to get back on whatever task you were on. But that's at this point secondary because that's, mm -hmm. that's more a function of time and what you're doing with time, uh, excuse me, your attention. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're taking two hours a day and just let's just do simple math, everybody don't, I'm just a messenger. I'm just, th these are just the numbers. The average across 3 billion people right now 
are giving to these platforms 14 hours a week, minimally. That, my friends, is 56 hours a month. 56 hours a month. What would you do with 56 hours? Not a year, not a year, a month. Now, somebody in your position, Aaron, and certainly mine, who spent a life helping people get fit, have heard this. I don't have a lot of time. And yeah. I think to myself, you know where you can get 56 hours? Four, you know where you can get two hours a day? Yeah. And I just go, and they go, but that's not me. And I go, yeah, let's just check your screen time. And we'll do real math. And yeah. hope, your hope. Is that be, they're right. <laughs> to, be, to be a good person is that it doesn't look like that, but it does. Yeah. And even if it's less than that, mine was very minimal. When I did my, um, it's, it started as a sabbatical, it was 42 minutes a day across all platforms. Hmm. And I just thought, I, I just did simple math. Well, what if I could get five, six hours a week, a week back and 20 hours a month? For me, that made me way more valuable because it gave me more attentive, attentiveness to my children. It gave me more presence with those that I serve. I value those things more than I do somebody doing a cool dance or a cat on a ceiling fan. And um, so the next thing is attention. So these things, if, if we're spending two hours redirecting our attention, how does it work? And all these points are kind of intersect each other. So they're hard to separate. I, I make it distinguishable so that, you know, people in the health, fitness and wellness field can kind of like digest what, what I'm talking about. But, to, you know, it's a system of systems. These things are like really not separable. Yeah. So it's like your attention. What is happening in real time to your attentional capacity? Well, you're paying. If you're to ask anybody who's listening to this podcast, hey, what do you want to do tomorrow? Pay attention to the things that you really care about or pay attention to your socials. And somebody could say, well, my socials help me care about the thing. And, but that's not what I'm asking. What do you really care about? That, that's, I'm not asking about a secondary feeling or jumping to some kind of conclusion. The question is, what do you want to do tomorrow with your life? A mentor once asked me, this it used to teach me, he said, this day has been given to you fresh and clear. You can either use it or throw it away. So with that in mind, would tomorrow be a day where you could think about all the, read the book, be out in nature, do a recovery walk after a hard workout, take a meditation, make dinner for your family, sit with them, watch the Warriors in the second round of the playoffs, whatever it may be, um, might be a little bit more rewarding as far as your attention, your attention. And guess what? Our attention is limited by a few hours a day to pay attention to the things that we truly care about in a flow state, in a caring state. The rest of the time we're in automations. Yeah. And so if you throw away your attentional time, you become a garbage disposal for the others that, and, and the other being almost trillion dollar corporations that need your time and attention. Well, let's ask, how do they do that? The base of the brainstem and the amygdala work in a very interesting way. So because of our social, our, our biological necessity, necessity to group with one another, we can't get past that. We need each other. We need each other. And that is fundamental. The design knows that. So in the neocortex, front part of the brain is developed over a long time for us humans. We can make executive decisions that are hard. We can reflect on things like, like we are right now. Hey, what would I want to do with tomorrow? But if you're in a, an impulsive state, it, asking that question is not helpful because you can't answer it reflectively. Yeah. But extractive technology specifically keeps the patterning at the lower part 
of our brainstem. So it's very hard for us in real time, spent two hours a day, plus, minus, whatever, practicing attentional giveaway and rewarding impulsivity. So think about that. So now you've just taken a chunk of time and what the, the infinite scroll, what is that? Impulsivity yeah. in real time. Yeah. Go to the next thing, go to the next thing. So what's happening is that if you're taking it and just like, again, we are being reflective right now where we can analyze this thing with clear eyes and go, hey, tomorrow, what would be interesting to you? Do you want to be um, trained in intentionality or impulsivity? Which one? I think most people reflectively say, I would like to be intentional, sir. Every that, day that of the week and twice on Sunday. <laughs> totally. And, and yet, and yet, and here we are, and this is the state of the world right now. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's deeply concerning to me. Yeah. On an existential level, like some people would say the environment's the number one issue. I'd say our cognition is. And what we're doing is our, we are in real time at scale, two, three, four, in some cases, eight, 12, 14 hours a day, training impulsivity. And in what scenario in human history can you think of where impulsivity, impulsivity wins the day over time? Like, right, there are none. No. There are none. And so we have to ask ourselves and just pause for a second. Like, what are we contributing to? What are, what are your actions contributing to? And when I first went off social media almost five years ago, people were like, what? And I took my company off three years ago. P people were like, well, you, what, what's going on? Yeah, you're, I was insane. Just like, you're insane. It's, it's going to sink. You're going to sink. It's going to sink. Totally. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but the medium is the message. And if I'm redirecting people in a toxic medium that makes them worse for the wear, I am ethically responsible for that, I value integrity and my personal and professional belief is that if you're gonna do it, live it and be it. And that means in the business too. And it's not, but it helps me get to my end. Yeah, but in helping others, and this is where, you know, I hope to be more vocal in the fitness, health and wellness fields because Socials are used as a medium to communicate to audiences. But the, the, these questions still need to be fundamentally answered. And I, to me, it's unacceptable to go, well, I like them. But, and, and also to challenge the concept that somebody's intent outweighs the outcome. Because guess what? Your intent doesn't control a $900 billion corporation with responsibility to shareholders. I'm sorry, it doesn't. Yeah. This is, these are the best corporations ever designed. They are doing a, a great job as a company. They're the most efficient things that, that has happened in business in human history. Yeah. So they're, they're great at what they do. Yeah, and, Facebook and, did what the FBI and CAA have been trying to do for 50, 60 years, and they did it overnight. And we did it and willingly, <laughs> like getting totally. willingness from that. Totally. Right? totally. Yeah. And so, you know, if, and again, if, if you're changed, so all these things are related, right? We have, we have a limitation in our willpower, right? To do hard things. And the only way humanity can survive, let alone live and thrive healthily, as you know, is you must intentionally choose to do hard and difficult things to make yourself more resilient to life's difficulties. Yeah. And if you, if you tap that well and take all the water out of it, what's left? Frictionless, effortless things? that don't require intention, that's, that. Th these are real questions that I, th I think warrant an answer. And, so, and a listener could easily go, well, it sounds so easy when you do it like that, but it's, it, but it's a lot harder than that. And, and, I, and I, I, I kick back and go, right, and let's just answer the questions. I, I, I have to be direct in, in, yeah. the, in this message and saying, yeah. if these, if, if, Time and attention and impulsivity 
are directed towards an amplification of negative emotions. Clinically, undeniable at this point. Yeah. The amplitude of, of anxiety and depression, suicide, like a lot of people would have liked to assign it to COVID. And what happened during COVID? People went even more into their socials, right? Yeah. And so, so uh, we can't solve the human health problem, the human cognition problem, the environmental problem, which are our three big existential situations for your children and mine by going short form and arguing in environments that don't facilitate actual depth neocortex thinking. Yeah. So a, a quick question then, do you, do you see our current state of being not, not just attracted, but we fell head over heels in love with this social media thing. Do you see that as uh, a natural, unintended or intended consequence from the choices that we've made to make things more comfortable, more convenient, more uh, all of that? You know, sort of the the saying where you know bad times uh, breed strong men, strong men breed good times, good times breed weak men, and weak men. Yeah. bad times kind of a thing but like art do you find that we're somewhere on that continuum and you're Listen. a pioneer taking the first step away into something that's yeah. difficult yeah. to help well, humanity well, yeah straight up and, and and i borrow some of this thinking but like i'm, I'm a fan of of, of huxley aldous huxley if, if you or anybody have read huxley you know we're, we're in this um sort of huxley and dystopia right now but and, and I, would, I wouldn't even say that we're we're you know, at the beginning of it, we are in the middle of it right now. Yeah. And for, for the listeners, Huxley just describes a world in which our frivolity is what kills us. Like our, our, our need for like stuff that doesn't matter becomes the thing of the day. And we are so preoccupied with that, that we forget to take care of the more fundamental things. And yeah. that's where we're at. That, and we're arguing about like smaller things, not taking care of the bigger things. And, and it's in an environment, you know, these socials do, they, <laughs> unfortunately, they just divide people so naturally because yeah. that's what, that's how the algorithms, even if they're trying to fix the algorithms, but that's, that's how we, they keep time and attention, which is the valuation of the company. Yeah. Like, we can't get away from it. So the, the, the economic piece of it is tied with our emotional piece of it, which is, tied to our social biological piece, but here we are, will semi-willingly playing. Yeah. Like a lot of people aren't thinking about this in this context. I, I would say autonomically in, involved. I, I, maybe the first step might've been willfully. Uh, well, in, in 2011 and 12, actually the timeline does matter. 2010, 11 and 12, the algorithms were slightly different than they are now. And now, yeah. they're, now they're drastically different. 2000, um, going from 211 to 212, um, um, Google and um, Facebook sh changed some of the algorithmic qualities, and then and then all the others did as well once they came on. And you know they they found a level of stickiness that just made it so it that it made it really difficult for people to get off. And so when and here's the thing too, people will go it's a tool and it's like, no, these aren't tools. These are behavioral modifiers is what they are. And you don't know that you are being behaviorally modified. A case in point, you've got 56 hours a month going to something that if I were just to say in a state of reflection, do you want to get 56 hours a month to Facebook this month or Instagram or TikTok or whatever? Yeah. It's, everybody would say no. Yeah, your knee jerk response would be to say no. When you're reflecting, but when yeah. you're in it, you can't get out of it. No, yeah. Even, even the people who design it can't get out of it. And by the way, the people who design it don't let their kids do it. Message to everybody. Message to everybody. The, the, the tech designers that build it do yeah. not let their They're children. They're like, here's some wooden blocks. Go build something. Totally. Not yeah. here's a screen. <laughs> totally. So, and again, screens aren't the enemy. Extractive technology yeah. is the thing to consider. Yeah. And what we what humanity needs to do right now is to have a, this larger, this, so the big question is, what are we going to do about this? And like, and so there's lots of layers of answers. A few years ago, I took a very uh, straightforward response. And it's just one of those ones where go, I can control what I can control. Mm -hmm. 
I have a small population of people that I worry about. I'm not going to willingly redirect them to pools that I know to be toxic, period. Yeah. Yeah. Period. My job, by definition of my company, sustainable growth and preparing them to be better versions of themselves using physicality require less time on these platforms, period. Yeah. Therefore, do not communicate on those platforms, Yeah. period. I, I don't need to say that is, now, what do we have? We have a small boutique gym, voted the best gym in the Santa Monica last year. Boom. <laughs> it's a seven figure business with a small team of five full-time coaches and a few part-time coaches. That's how you do it. And, it's it's doable and it's not um it's not something that is impossible you you just got to know kind of what you're planning to do going into it and i i was just pretty steadfast like the the team my team kicked back and the good thing about having a team is they force you to go, well, come up with a logical argument for it. And I came up with an impenetrable one. Yeah. Because it's just reasoning. Yeah. And the role of logic in human history is to make a documentation of this is an aspirational way to live under pressure. And under pressure, you're going to be impulsive and emotions are going to go all over the place and your tension is going to be stretched. But what do you do? You, go, you come back to the basics. And we've defined those basics that are important for us. It allows us to go move away social media. We, you, you do not get our time. You do yeah. not get our attention. You will not train us to be impulsive because we're humans and we're impulsive as it is. Yeah. <laughs> I've got tons of things that I, like all my stuff. I have stuff I'm working. I don't need any more amplification of impulsivity. Don't need it. Yeah. yeah. You know? And the last thing is that like it's so we're also capable of negativity. And so how, how do we, you know, buffer against that? So here's what, here's the immediate response to that. That's what this is. So I, I have to believe that there's some team member or some client customer that's still drinking from the pool. hundred hmm. percent. Almost. I would say that like, you know, uh, probably, if, if I'm estimating, there's probably 80% that are still on, but I will say this, they've started to minimize and become much more aware of the usage. Mm -hmm. So that is that, you know, of course, that's a starting point. But then the other part is that, that we can responsibly um, say is like, we're not redirecting them to it. You know, so we're not going, here's our, here's our video what we do is it we use technology like vimeo for example which is non-extractive versus youtube which is extractive and so there's you know there's sort of and we can get into the weeds on, on that but there's yeah. ways to like you know chronicle these things and go okay which one is extractive non-extractive and which one supports you know the broader um the broader mission so you know we very intentionally kind of go look this is you know, it's one of the reasons why I'm not on Chrome. You know, you and I had right yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh -huh. Chrome with Google and 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 some of the you know some of the access points that that Chrome wants. Um, like I, I've got so many uh, blocks uh, <laughs> for privacy blocks. Like it just doesn't. Like I put up the Chrome thing and it was like it was so difficult. And so you know, it does make communicating sometimes. Um, challenging in real time with people. I, I, I will say that. But here's the other thing. I'll, I'll say this too, is that I've been coaching for long enough to remember a time when just simply saying some, uh, in 2009, when we'd say, hey, there's a barbecue three weeks from now, everybody in the class was situationally aware and present to the fact that those words were being said and could recall that we're going to go to the barbecue in three weeks on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Then 2011, 12, 13, and then and we started to communicate things. And at one point I asked the team, this is about 2016, how many platforms are we communicating on? And the answer was 11. And 11. So, you know, and that, that included email and flyers. But what was happening, what happened in that seven years? People's attentional capacity diminished. 
So I was communicating in 11 ways with no efficacy to zero to no efficacy or little to no efficacy versus 2009 saying it once and seeing a third of the population. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you say that I've, I've got an experience where I hired laborers um, to, to help me build my house up here in Northern Idaho. And, uh, and my, my br- best and brightest worker, he did, he does the most um, detail oriented, incredible work because he's on the socials. And I, I find the same thing uh, for myself as well, but because he, like, I would have to literally explain something to him. He's my best, the very best, right? I would have to explain something to him seven times. Yeah. Like average, which is, it's insane to me. Because I I think, well, and and look, this is more anecdotal than it is clinical. Because that's right at best, you know, we're throwing lobs at, at it, but yeah because I've been coaching so long, I've seen an intentional drop in capacity. Like people can't pay attention as much now. Yeah, They're just, look, life's hard. And it's going to like pull people out of focus just because it is. And you need time. Like there's just some, there's things in our human lives, but like, I would say that the enormity of life itself stacked with this, um, this attentional like siphoning of your, of our capacity uh, is making it so it's harder for people to hear, yeah. like in real time. Yeah. And so there's there's a lot of other aspects to this too. So if people, you know, we know of all kinds of apneas that are happening because of because of social use and emails and these kind of things, um, but th- th- you know that's just a state of our neurobiology. And so if you're asking people to be physical and their neuro- neurobiology is all jacked up meaning that they're stimulated from something and, and they're, they're like, they're staring at you and they're, they're like literally warming up on a bike or something, but there's the nervous system still hasn't like flushed out the agitation that it had just experienced prior to coming in. Right. And so that, that we have, to, again, it comes to attentional capacity. Like we're, we're, we're if we, if it's, if we know for sure that it's already limited, and we're draining that we're, we're, we're double screwing ourselves Yeah. because it's only going to be hard. Like, that's the thing. It's like, Hey, everybody, life is hard. Like it's gnarly. You're we're choosing this, this, you know, Huxleyan sort of experience, but not knowing that it's making the things that we're interested in e- even harder because mm-hmm. we can't pay attention as much. Like it's, yeah. We're thinking it's, it's utopian, but it is actually dystopian. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like we're thinking this is good. And then it's actually pulling more and more from us. Right. Totally. And so our evolution as a as 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 a company using this sort of mindset is like, look, the the tools that we use have to match the approach that we take. And if we're taking this approach, like we're trying to prepare humans to be better versions of themselves, our company's directive is not to use these platforms because otherwise we are contributing to the thing that we know creates malaise and sickness. And I mean, look, you can even, t- I mean, you can just go like being in a kyphotic posture for anybody in the health and fitness field. Like, do you want your people staring at a phone with the neck forward, you know, 15 degrees for two yeah. hours a day? Like just ask- Great for the lymphatic system, which is totally. great for the immune system. <laughs> totally. Great for the traps and great for the headaches and <laughs> the lats aren't on this kind of record, and then there's orthopedic issues and you know i mean why do they not have anterior posterior pelvic tilt like i wonder you know like 56 hours a month minimally rounded like that like on top of just rounding and all the other situations that we're rounding in yeah. like look there's a million reasons but like i come back to the four majors as 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 sort of guideposts to organize the the conversation and you know look people did think we were a little bit suicidal or reckless or whatever but it it has worked out for us and we do have a a much more bought-in community we don't have to worry about there's no like nonsensical competition with people you know one of the other things that like drove me nuts about like some of the stuff is that like when i was starting to do it some years ago. And this is just a, a personal frustration that I have is like people that I really cared about suddenly became like unintentional enemies. 
And I was like, well, I'm very capable of not holding them as enemies. And like suddenly there, there's this whole different experience that I was having emotion with people that I really loved and cared for in the fitness, health and wellness space. I'm like, what, like, how am I getting wrapped? And I just like, man, put it away. I just, that, that's a yeah. dance that I don't want to tangle with at a, you know, in a ball game that is not worth playing. And it, it's so, just not so it's, it's, it's working at Oak Park, right? It's okay. working in your, your tightest community and it's an incredibly tight community, high, super high retention, Super high. It, it doesn't. It doesn't matter the acquisition because the retention is so high, right? 100%. But I'm sure there is acquisition. What about? Uh, do you have any? Is this being laid out in your executive group? Because I know you have an executive group. You kind of talked about that for a second. Um, yeah. Wanted to jump into that for just a moment. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's funny because I have a a group that's called the the, the Treehouse, and you know, our gym's called Oak Park, home of CrossFit, CrossFit Los Angeles. And the treehouse is sort of like the, the, the tip of the spear for leadership development. And so we take, basically, it's a group of celebrities and, um, and high-level executives. Um, and we do three-month blocks of, of development. And we look at um, growth. So the, the function of the treehouse, by definition, is we grow ourselves and we grow each other on purpose. And so when we break down growth as a, a function of, of being a human being, so that it could be personal, professional, or both, you go, well, how does growth happen? And growth happens um, if, if you take somebody's purpose and match it with their actions. Like if those two things are aligned, that's the, that's above, that's the, that's the part that somebody can willingly control. Are you doing something with purpose and you know your why and do your actions and do your behavior support it? But then there's a whole other 50% of this equation that it's like, do people in your relationship sphere support that or do they hinder that? Because that matters. And so if you're in toxic and, uh, you know, relationships, it, it, it can inhibit that. But if you're in positive relationships, it can support that. And a, a basic way to think about this, because I know a lot of coaches and, and, and people in, in fitness are listening to this, is like, you know, somebody could be a weightlifting specialist, but somebody comes to you to improve their 5K time. Might not be a good fit. Might not be a good relationship to professionally engage in, right? Conversely, if somebody's, you know, trying to PR in a 5K, you know, a weightlifting coach, you know, I'm, I'm big on lifting for, for runners, but like it still might be getting a running coach might be the first stop, yeah. right? So just getting the relationships right is key, right? And that, that's tier one thinking, but then you can go tier two, tier three, like what are the other support relationships in life? What are, you know, f familial things, all these other things and friendship circles and all that stuff. And then finally, the fourth piece of the quadrant of growth is the, the systems that you participate in, in the environment that you play in. So if you have an environment that's toxic, you could have the most purposeful person doing all the right things, but they might not ever get out of whatever socioeconomic thing. And, it, and, and it's not by, they might have all the intent, but also some environmental and systemic things go into play. Yeah. So the quadrant really is taking psychology and collapsing the dualism between two primary schools of thought, which have dominated you know, the, the, the zeitgeist of fitness, health, and wellness, which is you got you to gotta do it or you got to be in the right place. And it's just like, both, both are true. Mm -hmm. Both are true. Some of it's self-will, which is limited. Yeah. That's why you need support. And that's why you need to be around people who support the appropriate behaviors to get to the end that you're interested in purposefully growing towards. So we use that quadrant as the basic fundamental tool to grow this high performing group. And um, what we then do is go through a series of exercises throughout each three month block, using this as the primary check-in point. Like, mm -hmm. how are you growing? And it's the, I'm the facilitator and everybody in the group's job is to kind of hold, okay, Aaron said this, Kenny said that, they're to hold you accountable to the thing that you said that you, was important to you. And then, and then we, we listen using three vehicles of communication understanding, which is you listen for conviction, authenticity, and vulnerability. So if somebody's really convicted and they're, they're doing something with stones, if you feel like it's coming from a 
uh, an authentic place and it has me actual meaning in their life. Mm -hmm. And finally, if they're vulnerable enough to kind of take the feedback on the thing that it is that they're trying to grow. So those are heavy. That's hard stuff. It's hard stuff. And, 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 I'm really proud of the, the, the work that these guys are doing. They, they are, I mean, they're, they're, you know, a lot of household names and stuff and just doing real, real profound work. Um, and it's, it's helping me grow personally as a coach, because it's, a, it, you know, it, it, it's sort of the, 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 the tip of the spear for me, but it also forces me to be like, you know, on, on my A game, you know? Yeah. So. Well, Kenny, you're, <laughs> Obviously, clearly, your heart is broken wide open and pouring onto the people that are close to you, near and dear to you, your your community. Um, you called it the treehouse? The treehouse. Yeah, the treehouse, Oak Park. Um, uh, and I know your family, and, I, and obviously, we're running out of time. Uh, we could go on and on and on and talk about a, a sure. ton of different things. So I, the time. I know you got to go. Yeah. So, so I do, I do want to kind of wrap it up and I'm sure this is considering all of the stuff that you talked about um, and care about. Um, obviously this is close to you. What is living fit to you? And obviously not living fit the brand, but living fit and uh, can you can you simplify it or you know because obviously quadrant is that's pretty simple but there's a lot going on in those quadrants yeah, yeah. um and when same I, with oak park so yeah when i when i think of living fit i just th- i think of one simple thing making that choice every single day and that's mm-hmm. that's an act of will mm-hmm. and and making that choice to live fit and and treating it as a heuristic because what's the other living unfit so ask yourself that, do you want to live unfit or do you want to live fit? And so that, that's the starting point. And to me, just like when we were talking about the socials, like it's for everybody in a reflective state, it's an obvious answer, but doing it, that's where, that's where, that's where the, that's where the glory is. Yeah. We're, we're, we're almost like stuck in this weird negative feedback loop of, of habit and routine yeah. that is comfortable because we're, doing the same cycles kind of over and over and over again, but it's making us so uncomfortable. So yeah. I'd love, it's like, no, Will, like you can, you can totally. choose. Choose it, choose it. Put, choose put it, it in that upper yeah. cortex. Put, put yourself get, get out of that thing, amygdala, lower limbic totally. stuff. <laughs> totally. Put yourself in the position, put yourself in the position, put yourself in the position, just practice that. That's living fit. Man, I love that. And, and you, in order to do that, you got to think reflectively too, which is a, oh, totally a huge through line through this whole conversation. It's like, well, if I'm thinking about this truly, it's like, well, yeah. maybe, maybe I'm not willing the thing that is yeah. making me fit. Totally. Kenny, this is, uh, it's beautiful. I, I love, I love hearing your voice. I love seeing your facial expressions, but man, did we go deep. I'm like, uh, I got a lot of, I got a lot of heart stuff going on right now. I was like getting a little teary. eyed just thinking about how, like how much I can see your servant leadership, your sacrificial love for your community, just hearts broken. Uh, yeah. Pouring onto the the people that are, that are close to you. And well, let's um, go. man, they, they, uh, whether they know it or not, they are incredibly uh, blessed to have uh, you in their lives. And we are inc- incredibly blessed to have you on the show. So thank you so much. Aaron, always a treat, buddy. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending the time and having me on. Boom. Hey, for more interviews like that, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, if you're looking for not only those interviews, but follow along programs, exercise breakdowns, workouts, nutrition plans, and fitness equipment for your fitness results. Make sure you hop on to living.fit, become a member today, and I'll see you on the next one.